150 years ago, Charles Darwin transformed science with his theory of natural selection. Natural selection acts only by taking advantage of slight successive variations. She can never take a great and sudden leap, but must advance by short and sure, though slow steps. In 1831, Darwin, then 22 years old, set sail on a five-year survey expedition for the British Empire on the HMS Beagle, traveling around the southern tip of South America, then north toward a chain of volcanic islands in the Pacific called the Galapagos. On this desolate archipelago, 600 miles off the western coast of Ecuador, Charles Darwin encountered an extraordinary array of birds, reptiles, and mammals, the likes of which he had never seen before. For more than a month, Darwin studied plant and animal life, took extensive notes, and collected specimens. Then he left, never to return. Twenty-five years passed as he developed a theory about how the diverse forms of life on Earth had originated. In 1859, Darwin published a book titled On the Origin of Species. Its impact on science and ultimately all of Western culture was dramatic. Darwin argued that all life was the product of purely undirected natural forces. Time, chance, and a process he called natural selection. Natural selection was a powerful idea. Physical variations that proved advantageous would be inherited by succeeding generations. Through this process, populations would be altered, and over time, fundamentally different organisms would arise without any form of intelligent guidance. Darwin wanted to explain everything in the history of life in terms of undesigned, unintelligent natural processes. And when he looked for an explanation, what he found was that a process he could observe in domestic populations also operates in the wild. Now Darwin himself was very familiar with domestic breeding. He himself studied pigeon breeding. And he knew that for centuries, human breeders had been able to make dramatic changes in populations by selecting only certain individuals to breed. Darwin really suggested that this same process operates in the wild. Darwin was not the first scientist to propose a theory of evolution, but he was the first to offer a plausible naturalistic mechanism that could produce biological change over long periods of time. To understand how natural selection works, Consider the finch populations Darwin encountered on the Galapagos Islands. Thirteen species of finches inhabit the Galapagos Islands, and they vary subtly in terms of their body size and shape of the beak. Darwin returned to England with nine different species of these birds. According to contemporary Darwinian theory, differences in the sizes and shapes of the birds' beaks are the direct result of natural selection. One example often cited involves species of seed-eating finches. Following seasons of heavy rain, small soft seeds are plentiful throughout the islands. Birds with short beaks can easily gather food. However, during periods of drought, the only seeds available are encased in hard, tough shells that remain on the ground from the previous year. In these circumstances, only birds with longer, sharper beaks can crack the shells and eat the seeds. Those birds with the longer beaks survive because they can reach the food source, whereas other birds cannot. That long beak, then, confers what biologists now call a functional advantage. The finches with smaller beaks, unfortunately, die out from starvation because they cannot reach that food source. If the drought conditions continue, the environment causes a change in the features of the finch population as a whole. 
over time, the long beaks are passed on to succeeding generations because those beaks enable the birds to survive. Charles Darwin compared the history of life on Earth to a great branching tree. The base of the tree represented the very first living cell. And the branches were new and more complex life forms that had evolved over time from the first primitive organism. Darwin was trying to explain how the branches on the tree of life originated. He was trying to show how natural selection could have modified existing organisms to produce the great diversity of plant and animal life that fills the earth today. But when it came to the base of the tree, which represented the origin of the first life, the first living cell, Darwin had very little to say. In fact, in The Origin of Species, he didn't even address the question of how life might have originated from non-living matter. The only glimpses we have of Darwin's opinions on the subject appear in a letter he wrote to a colleague named Joseph Hooker. Regarding the first production of a living organism, if, and oh what a big if, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat and electricity present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes, at the present such matter would be instantly devoured. But this may not have been the case before living creatures were formed. During the final years of his life, Darwin did little to develop his idea that a primitive cell might have emerged from simple chemicals in the primordial waters of the early Earth. But later in the 1920s and 30s, a Russian scientist named Alexander Oparin formulated a detailed theory about how this could have happened. It was called chemical evolution. Oparin thought that he could explain the origin of the first life using Darwinian principles. He envisioned simple chemicals combining and recombining to form larger molecules, and then these larger molecules organizing themselves with the help of chance variations and natural selection into the first primitive living cell. Over the next three decades, Many scientists worked to develop and refine these ideas as they pondered the questions both Oparin and Darwin had raised. How could life have evolved from simple chemicals? 